Well, I did not coordinate with uh, Mrs. Kreiman before the service, so we are on the same page, though. I was thinking this Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Easter, is always Good Shepherd Sunday, and I realized I don't see many shepherds around Monroe County. And so whereas I may know a little bit about pastoring and a little bit about being a musician, mostly enough to know where I fall short in both of those categories, um, I'm not really sure about what makes for a good shepherd. So I thought I would do a little research. One of the first things I came up with is that apparently there are different ways of shepherding. And we who are of mostly European descent the way, here in the West have a very different way we've inherited of shepherding from that which they do in the Near East or the Holy Land. So I had to learn a little bit about the way they shepherd because that's what Jesus would have been referring to. That is what the people would have had experience with when Jesus talked about being a, a good shepherd. Well, the first thing a good shepherd needs to be able to do is, as Mrs. Kreiman said, to tend the flock. That is, to bind up their wounds, to take care of them when they get injured. This happens a lot in the Holy Land. It's very rugged territory. And you have thorn bushes that tear at the animal's skins and rocks that they can trip over and break legs and things like this. So it's important that the shepherd be able to take care of his sick and wounded sheep. Also, he needed to protect them against not just predators, which would have been more common in Jesus' era before there was so much civilization around, but also marauders. People would try to come in and steal the sheep away so they could have them for themselves. Jesus needed to, the good, excuse me, any good shepherd needed to protect against predators and marauders. He'd also need to help the flock over physical obstacles. See, in America, we're used to thinking of a farm as something that you build a fence around and then you keep all your animals in the pasture land that belongs to you. But in the Holy Land, it's more of a migrant kind of thing. They will wander around a given area. And so they encounter physical obstacles, like, for instance, a stream. Something like McMichael's Creek, not far down the road here. Well, getting a flock of sheep across a stream is a hazardous affair. And the way they do it in the Holy Land is that the shepherd finds a good place on the stream where it's shallow enough or the current's not so swift. And he goes across the stream ahead of the sheep. Now what happens is the sheep who are closest to the shepherd, who know his voice best, who trust him, who when they bed down at night try to get themselves physically closest to the shepherd, will immediately follow the shepherd across the stream at the right place. And so they make it across easily. Those members of the flock who don't know the shepherd so well, who maybe don't have that level of trust with him yet or whatever, they follow a little bit further back and the whole herd starts to drift down current, downstream. And so they have a little more trouble getting across. And last come the weakest of all. Sometimes the lambs in their midst and usually by that time, the stream has gotten more hazardous than where the shepherd tried to cross in the first place. So oftentimes they'll be swept downstream and what happens is the shepherd immediately needs to jump into the stream and grab that lamb or that elder member of the flock and lift them up in his arms and carry them close to his chest out of the water and onto the farther bank. Well, apparently what happens when they get the whole flock across is that they'll all gather around the shepherd going, meh, 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 and they're all so happy they've all made it. And they have this little flock party <laughs> on the side of the stream. So getting them across those physical obstacles is important. But also, there's finding the stray sheep. My, um, my best friend's father growing up was a, a big animal vet, a, a farm vet, and he always said to us, he said, Smartest animal on the farm is a pig. Dumbest animal on the farm is a sheep. <laughs> and a sheep who wanders off from the rest of the flock has no sense of direction. No sense at all of where they are. So if one of the flock wanders off down a little bit of a rabbit trail or a cul-de-sac in the, amidst the, uh, the cliffs and the things of the Holy Land, they're likely to get stuck there. 
And at the end of the day, the shepherd needs to go round each of them up individually and bring them back to rejoin the rest of the flock. A shepherd also must plan. This was a surprise to me. Not only must feed his flock, I knew that, but he needs to plan for their feeding because in this sort of migrant world they live in, they can't simply put them out in the same pasture every day or on the same hills. So what happens is in the spring, when there's a lot of new growth coming up, like in my yard right now, where I'm wishing I had a sheep so I didn't have to mow, um, when that's coming up, they can, they, can, they can put them out to pasture right near their house. But that gets eaten up pretty quickly. So then they need to start moving. Well, what they will move is uh, through the various crop cycles that are going on. And that they, what happens is, is that first the crop comes up, they harvest the crop, whoever owns the field. Then comes the gleaning. And this is where the poor of the area can come in and anything that wasn't taken up in the first harvest, they can go through and just pick up the scraps so they have something to eat. When the poor are done, then the sheep come in and really clean house. Well, that only lasts for part of the year as well. And so then they must move from the early spring crops to where they get summer straw and finally as you get to winter one of two things happens if it's a very poor shepherd and they have a small enough flock they physically bring them into their house and they live with the sheep for a couple of months and they put their family up on a second floor so they're not actually on the dirt floor with the sheep and the, the shepherd needs to go out and get the food and physically bring it back to the sheep and then muck out the floor of the house. If it's a larger flock and that's, that's not a tenable solution, they'll take them up into the mountainside, up into the wilderness areas nearby and by this time all of the low-lying food has been eaten so the shepherd spends all day going around to the bushes and the shrubs cutting off the higher food and putting it on the ground so that the sheep can eat. So the, sh the shepherd does, is not only responsible for feeding his flock that day, but he has to plan ahead as to where they're going to feed next week and next month. He has to know everything he, he needs to know to care for and feed his flock. And then there's gathering the scattered sheep. Now understand this is different. A stray sheep is a lone one that wanders off. Like you said, sheep are not the brightest animals on the farm. So it's easy to scare them. And that can scatter the flock. You get them all in one place and all of a sudden they go Boom, and they're everywhere. Now do you know how the shepherd gathers the flock? They're all over. He can't go one by one and bring them in. He stands in the middle of an open field and starts calling their names. And they respond to his voice. And they come from wherever they're scattered to this voice that they know and trust. And they regather as a flock. This is undoubtedly what Jesus had in mind when in today's reading he says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus knows just like any good shepherd, every one of his flock. A shepherd bringing his sheep in from a day's grazing usually counts the sheep as they enter the fold for the night. But sometimes the shepherd dispenses with that counting, for he is able to feel the absence of any sheep that's missing. With one sheep gone, something is felt to be missing from the appearance of the entire flock. One shepherd in Lebanon was asked if he always counted his sheep each evening. He replied, no. And when he was asked how then he knew if all his sheep were present, this was his reply. He said, Master, if you were to put a cloth over my eyes and bring me any sheep and only let me put my hands on its face, I could tell in a moment if it was mine or not. When Lieutenant Colonel Harry R.P. Dixon worked amongst the desert Arabs as a colonial uh, officer for the British, he was treated as a member of the Anazat tribe because he had wet nursed with one of their people and that's what uh, Islamic law requires. So he was really brought into intimacy with the people he worked with and he got to see some amazing things. One thing he witnessed 
was an event that revealed, I think, very clearly the amazing knowledge which some shepherds have of their sheep. One evening, shortly after dark, an Arab shepherd began to call out by name each of the 51 mother ewes in his flock. As he called out their name and they came to him, he was able to match their little lamb with the mother. Now this would be amazing enough in the light, but he's doing this in pitch dark amidst all the chaos of all the moms crying out for their babies and the babies crying out for their moms. But no shepherd, no shepherd anywhere has had the intimate knowledge of each of his flock that Jesus has. As Psalm 139 says, He knew you before you were knit together in your mother's womb. He knew you from before the foundation of the world. He knows you personally. And He calls you by name personally. He knows each of us. And he gathers us to, together to take us not over some small stream to a slightly better pasture seasonally, but to carry us across the great river Jordan into that greenest of pastures where his father's house is. He fights off sin, death, and the devil to take us safely there. Which is why he is our good shepherd. And why we give praise to him this day. And every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.